Good morning. Welcome to Northmont. Thank you so much for being here this morning on this rainy rally day. Uh, we are excited to get things started, and if you were uh, with us this morning, we had a, a new uh, adult education offering, and so uh, things are, are, are getting off on a, on a high note, hopefully. Uh, just a couple of announcements for you as we uh, look at a, a busy week here at Northmont. Um, first, uh, our small group ministry is being launched and uh, if you are someone who was thinking about it or has contacted me or couldn't come to our orientation meeting um, on Wednesday, I decided to give you the information that you need in terms of joining a small group that I would post, well, I didn't do it, Stephanie did, so thank you, 15 pink flyers so you can't miss them throughout the church. There's one directly back here, uh, right behind Fred. And so if you were someone who was interested in small group ministry but uh, couldn't make it, um, on that flyer are the groups that are meeting, the people who are in that group, what generally they'll be talking about, and what day and time they will meet. So some of the groups uh, meet in the evening, some meet on Sunday, some meet uh, during the day, during the week. So there should be, hopefully, in this first uh, six-week chunk that we're starting this, an opportunity for you to, to be a part of one of them if you would like to be. If one of them doesn't work for you, but you'd still like to be a part of it, you have a couple of other options. One, um, you can wait until that first six weeks is over, and then when we revamp after the six weeks, we can figure out maybe other times that would work for you. Or um, we can see if other people who have voiced interest in small groups can meet the time that you can meet. Uh, so we will certainly work on that in whatever way we can. We're starting something new here, and we're, uh, this is sort of a, a test run. So uh, the groups are going to get started this week. Uh, on the flyer it says when, so uh, please check those uh, pink flyers out wherever you can. Um, second, after the worship service this morning, there will be a, uh, what we're calling an opportunity fair downstairs. What we have noticed in the past is sometimes there's this feeling like, well, what, what are the groups in this church? What, what can I be a part of? Uh, I know that they're there, but I'm not really sure what they are. And then at other times it's like, well, what is the session or the deacons up to? Like, what, how do I get this information? What is Presbyterian women, et cetera, et cetera? Well, we've set up tables downstairs with uh, really fancy uh, poster boards and trifolds and information uh, things for you to know, things for you to perhaps sign up for, things for you to get involved in in some way. Uh, there's committees, there's groups, there's uh, all sorts of things. So um, when you go downstairs, um, please just peruse. Even if you think you know what these groups are up to, there's a good possibility that there are elements of that that you don't. Uh, and so please just peruse those tables as you're snacking on whatever you're snacking on and uh, see if there might be an opportunity there for you to take advantage of. Also, um, we are looking for the, the following things for the cookout that we're having, the kickoff cookout that we're having on Wednesday evening uh, that all of you are invited to. Um, the, uh, the cookout is from 6 to 8. Did I get the, the time right? Anybody? Yes? I got nods. Okay. Uh, it's from 6 to 8. Uh, all of you are invited. Uh, all of our youth and children are invited who come to the um, Wednesday Club. And we're also inviting all of the families from the preschool to come and join us for a cookout uh, that will be supplied by Spiritual Formation and the choir. So um, we need two things to make this cookout work. Uh, a grill, uh, but we can do it otherwise if we, if we don't have it. But assuming that it's going to be good weather, uh, we need a grill. So if you happen to have one that you could either transport here or could hypothetically have transported from your house, please let me know. Uh, you could also let uh, Tara know or Steph know, um, and then we could make arrangements for that. Uh, the other thing we would uh, appreciate are yard games. I know you could, somewhere in your basement, there's probably some sort of bocce set. We would love to borrow it for the day, uh, and so if you have that and can donate it, uh, that would be appreciated as well. Also, if you are a youth or a parent or a youth or just know a youth or just like youth, um, there is going to be a youth barbecue with the 319 group um, that's going to meet at Highland at 530. Uh, so if that affects you, just go straight to Highland 
You don't have to come here. So they're all meeting at Highland. Um, the last thing I have is um, since the, the, uh, we didn't have the prayer chain this week, um, I wanted just to let you know that uh, Jill Gable, um, uh, she was in the hospital for a night or two uh, under observation, and now she's home. Uh, she uh, has experienced and did experience, again, these sort of uh, mini strokes. And so they wanted to make sure that that was passed and that she was okay. So I got word today from Jody, thank you for finding Jim, uh, that she is uh, home and they didn't, all of her scans were clear. Uh, so, but just continue to pray for them and for the Gable family as they just, you know, make sure that uh, Jill's health is uh, where it should be. Any other, I see Ted making a motion, creeping this way. And so there's something that he is going to tell us. At least he didn't describe me as lurking. <laughs> so, as many of you know, uh, many years ago, the Pittsburgh Presbytery entered into a partnership arrangement with the Synod of Blantyre in, in Malawi. Uh, the partnership was expanded to include South Sudan a few years ago, so it's now a three-way partnership. As part of the partnership, more than two dozen uh, individual congregations in the Pittsburgh Presbytery have formed partnership relationships with individual congregations in Malawi. And as you probably know, uh, our partnership church is the church in, at Mangochi. Every other year, a group of travelers from Pittsburgh visit Malawi and in alternate years, visitors from Malawi come to Pittsburgh. This year is one of those alternate years when folks from Malawi are coming over here. Uh, they are scheduled to be here uh, from October 10th to the 23rd. It's a group of some 20 or so uh, people from Malawi that will be coming. We don't know yet if any of those visitors are going to be from our partnership church in Mangochi. Typically in the past that's been the case, but uh, because of the way things are organized, it may or may not be that, that way uh, this year. I'll be going to a meeting tomorrow and find out more about exactly who's coming. But anyway, um, so the, the, uh, uh, there are two separate host periods that the Presbytery is looking for host families to, to volunteer to help, uh, help have these, uh, these guests with you. Uh, the, there are two separate periods that are defined from October 12th to the 18th and from the 18th to the 22nd. Um, so anyway, those who have served as hosts in the past uh, can attest, I think, to the value of the experience and um, how it can be a, a truly wonderful and, uh, and rewarding and even transformational uh, experience to have uh, the opportunity to, to be one-on-one uh, -on -one with, uh, with one of these uh, visitors from Malawi and, and experience that, uh, that friendship and, uh, and uh, camaraderie with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ from, from Malawi. Uh, so anyway, if you have an interest in uh, considering uh, helping to host, uh, you don't have to volunteer right away, but if you want to find out more information about it, uh, please see me uh, either uh, down at the opportunity fair after the after the service or at some other time um, i'll have more details about it and you'll see a little bit more about it in the in the bulletin coming up but if you have an interest in uh, in helping with hosting uh, please let me know and also we'll have a uh, uh, a group uh, that's assigned to uh, a planning committee to help uh, also share some of the uh, the, the sightseeing and and uh, uh, individual uh, activities for, for your hosting. So it won't, if you're uh, volunteering to host, it won't be all on you. There'll be others to help help uh, uh, share that that uh, requirement. So thank you very much. Thank you. Anything else? The last stand and meet and greet with one another.
Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship as it's printed in your bulletin and please stand if you're able. What I leave with is a blessing, but what I bring to worship comes first. My worship is an offering unto the Lord. I offer the Lord my repentance, my thanksgiving, my curiosity, and my devotion. My worship does not end in this building. I am sent out from here to live it every day. Come, let us worship God. Now please remain standing and join me in the prayer of invocation that's printed in your bulletin. As we enter this new season, O oh God, inspire us with ever-surrounding love and warmth. Breathe life into us and prepare us for what you have in store for us. Teach us the true meaning of discipleship and the true essence of what it means to be your church. This we ask in Christ's name. May be seated. We are called to confess not to be shamed, but to be claimed. We are called to confess not to be put down, but to be lifted. Let us do so now, first together and then silently. Please join me. Dear Lord, we come to you this morning to give our thanks and praise. You are God Almighty, the giver of life, hope, and forgiveness. We confess that we often forget that you are God, and we live as though we are in charge of the world. We stray from you and begin to believe the message of this world instead of the message of grace from you. Forgive us for being harsh and judgmental toward others, for being too quick to speak, for not bringing all of our thoughts and words before you in prayer. Help us to keep our eyes on you and our hearts centered in your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. In Christ we are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Amen.
Is there anyone else who would like to come up for the children's time, please? There we go. All right. These, these were, they were so anxious, they just couldn't, they couldn't wait. Got to get up there and hear what he's going to say. All right, question for you. Does anyone here like... Now, be honest. Be honest. Does anyone here like gifts? Raise your hand. Anybody? You're okay with gifts. Perfect. I don't have any for you. Um, I don't have, I didn't bring anything, so don't, don't think that's where we're going. Um, let me ask you this. If you think about the best gift maybe you ever got, what would you say it was? Hmm. Or a really good one. It doesn't have to be the best. But like a really good one. You're not sure? So everyone likes them, but you can't remember any of them? I don't know what that says about anybody involved. So one of the best gifts I ever got, one of the best gifts, that, well, I mean, I, uh, clearly I have lots of gifts over here, but one of the, like, the best gifts that I ever received as a kid, this might sound str- strange to you, but was a subscription to Sports Illustrated. I thought that was the best thing, like a, a magazine about sports every week, like, this is pre, you know, like, internet stuff. So, like, if you were going to get in-depth stuff, that was, I loved it, right? These are not the gifts that I'm talking about this time. They're more about the gifts that you get, that you use all the time. So, for instance, um, who here is, feels like they're really good at, like, they really like math? Anybody like really like math? One math person. Uh, are you a reading person? Okay. Who likes, uh, what do you really like? You like, really like reading? You, sir? School school or something you feel like you're really good at? History? Okay. So, at somewhere along the line, you were given the ability to, like, really think that that was a really good thing, something you're good at and something that you like. Well, in the Bible, we talk about lots of different types of gifts, right? We talk about the ability to to talk to people, to love people, to be compassionate, to be giving, to understand people. There's all sorts of things that that we get. But I want to ask you not so much about that as when you think about Christmas or something like that, who's usually the person who's giving you the gifts? It could be Santa, okay, good guy. What? Other people, mom and dad probably give you gifts, right? And why do you think your mom and dad give you gifts? You ever thought about it? Are they obligated by law? No? Because they love you, right? And it says something about them, right? The person giving you the gift says something about what they think about you, right? They don't give you the gift just because they have to, but because they love you and because they think that you are someone who would enjoy the gift and use it and love it and that they think that you are a special, wonderful person, right? So this story today is about the gifts that we get, but it's not only about us who get them, but it's also about God who gives them. It says something about God that God would want to give us these gifts. It means not only does God love us, but God sees something in us that God believes that everyone else in the world could enjoy. That is what God thinks about us, And that is the kind of God that we talk about every week, who loves us that much to give us what we need that we can share with the rest of the world. So I think that we should pray and be thankful for those things. All right, here we go. God, you give us all sorts of wonderful things. You give us families and shelters and and things to eat, but you also put within us talents and really good things. So we're thankful not only for what that means about us, we're also thankful for what we can do for other people and for what that means about you, someone who is loving and gracious and thinks the world of us. So we thank you and praise you. Amen. Thank you. Our first scripture reading this morning is from Psalm chapter 36, verses 5 through 10. If you'd like to follow along, you'll find it on page 510 of your pew Bible. Let's listen for the word of the Lord. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. 
your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your judgments are like the great deep. You save humans and animals alike, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of light and life. In your light we see light. O oh, continue your steadfast love to those who know you and your salvation to the upright of heart. The word of the Lord. Our second scripture reading comes to us not only from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 12 but also from Gene Eckert. And if you see... Uh, I don't think that you wrote it, Gene. I'm not trying to say that. Okay. Uh, But if you look in the middle of your bulletin, you'll see why Gene chose this particular scripture. But hopefully I bring that out um, as not only I read it, but that I uh, deliver this sermon. So uh, this is chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols and could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now, they are, there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are a variety of services, but the same Lord. And there are a variety of activities, but there is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit, to another of healing by that one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of those tongues. All of these are activated by one and the same Spirit who allots to each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. My friends, these two are God's words for us this morning. Let us pray. Holy One, seek us out. Show us who you are, who we are to be, and how we can be those who respond to you faithfully. Illumine your word that we might know your grace and that we might go into the world to live it out. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. So as I mentioned, we embark today on the second uh, part of a series called Getting to Know You, passages chosen by you for the purpose of sharing them with others and showing other people what you believe is important. So hopefully last week, Not only did you get to know the transfiguration a little bit better, but you also got a little bit into the mind of Jack Swick, which is, you know, either wonderful or dangerous. So uh, it's, uh, we got to know what he's thinking about a little bit more. And today we do the same thing uh, with this passage chosen by Gene. Last week we were attempting to answer questions. We had a, a series of questions that were asked. And we'll, we'll do that same thing this week, but this time the questions are my questions not your questions. Because in our passage today, provided by me and Jean Eckerd, we got some answers about what this passage is about. I gave her that nickname, Mean Jean, just now. They're all there in print, there in your bulletin. So this should be a pretty quick sermon. We know where it's going, so I shouldn't have to fill in too much. But this is a little bit like Jeopardy. We got the answer. Self-worth and the Holy Spirit for two Alex, or, I'm sorry, <laughs> what I was trying to say was, it's a little bit like Jeopardy. You think about the game Jeopardy and you think, well, uh, I'm trying to figure out what this is. Uh, I'll take self-worth and the Holy Spirit for 200, Alex. And so in this classic sort of contestant form, we have these questions following what Gene was saying this passage is about, self-worth. My questions are this, who is God and who am I? And what am I to do? 
And any Bible study that I am in, I just started one here this morning, any Bible study that I am in, you should be at some point able to answer some of those questions from the study that you're doing. Who is God in this passage? What do I learn more about who God is? Who am I? What am I, what am I here for? What is my identity? And then when I know those things, and only when I know those things, how am I supposed to respond to who God is and who God has made me to be? These are those standard questions that I ask myself. And so as we look at Gene's answer, this passage is about everyone's self-worth, I think we need to do some digging to get from my questions to that answer. And we've done this before, but let me remind you again that there's, there's some things that we need to know about these people of Corinth, the people that we're writing to this morning. It's an important, southern, uh, it's an important city in southern Greece, and it has some unique challenges because that church had uh, a blend of cultures and languages and financial status. It wasn't all the same type of folks. So Paul recognizes this because the issue arises time and time again that there's clearly a disparity between the haves and the have-nots, the people who feel like this and the people who feel like that. There's just a lot of blending going on. And you can imagine how that could be true if, if, if one person owns a hedge fund and the other person owns a 1981 Ford Pinto, their lives are just a little different. Their experiences are different. And so it's no surprise that Paul needs to spend a little bit of time talking about the nature of gifts. But he doesn't really start there in his talking about gifts. And like I've said probably every week since I've been here, context is key. So in the, fir- in the verses right before this passage, right before them, if you look in, in your Bibles this morning, it's talking about a passage that we have discussed on some level um, together. And it's Paul laying down for the people what they need to do with communion. So he gives to them what you and I hear every time we have communion, which are the words of institution. On the night of his arrest, our Savior took bread. He blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me, etc. Words that we still use to prepare ourselves, to center ourselves before receiving the elements of communion. So in order to make sure that communion was being done in, in, a, in a, a proper way, he sets some ground rules. Because if you remember in this passage, if you go back and read it, there were, they were celebrating this communion in different ways. And it meant that the people who were of means had a feast before them. And the people of little or no means had nothing to share. And this was clearly a problem. And so Paul wants to address it. And so he says, look, we need to be doing this in a different way. So these words, bread and cup, one, tell you what you're serving. And three, ensure that we are all doing this together. These are words that ensure that the table would be an equal place in the eyes of God. That no one would receive more or less than the other. This has always been true in heaven, but it's barely true on earth. And so it's for this reason that I have said to you before that I believe that communion is the most celebrated act of social justice that the world has ever known. We can't be the church that Christ called us to be unless this is who we are. So, who is God? Who am I? What am I to do? One, God is one who loves creation with perfect equality. Two, because this is true, I have tremendous self-worth. Thank you, Gene. And three, what am I to do? Love as God does. So then, we, after all of this about communion, we, Paul gets to the gifts part. And the reason that I decided to preach this particular passage today is twofold is also contextual. One, it's rally day, and all the things that start up, and all the people who are bringing all the things that they are. We've got small groups, we've got new classes, we've got youth, we've got children, we've got a cook-off, all of these things happening at once. And we also have the nominating season. And if someone just sighed, then I understand, Ron, 
I'm with you, right here, I'm with you. <laughs> Kurt, back there, I'm with you. We have this process that we're starting. And what we do in this process is that we prayerfully discern with you where God is going and how we can come alongside God and who are the individuals to help us do that. So we kick these things off. And so I thought this was a good passage to talk about gifts. It's the time of year where we're doing these things together. And clearly, as we see this passage... We've been working on what it means to share our gifts and to share the wealth for 2,000 years plus. This is not a new problem. The problem that the people in Corinthians had is the same problem that we have still. We are still trying to figure out how to use the gifts that are before us and how do we encourage people to use those gifts and how do we recognize their gifts. Clearly, we're still working on this problem. So... Where did we go wrong? Where do, we, where do we mess up when it comes to acknowledging and using and offering our gifts with one another? I think it's threefold. First, I think that gifts go underused. So I have a gift, but I either don't know that I have a particular gift. I know it, but I really can't share it right now. Or I know it and I'm afraid that I'm going to get sucked into the church vortex of which I will never return. And I'm not sure that I am willing to go that far. And if that sounds like any of you, and it sounded like it did because some of you last, you can raise your hand imaginarily. You don't have to actually do it. Just raise it in your minds. Second, gifts go under-recognized. And this is the real tragedy of gifts. Choosing who we will lead or serve is often, and I am the biggest culprit of this, is often an exercise in low-hanging fruit. Well, they've served before. Maybe she'll do it again. Well, they're my friend. I know him. He's a pretty good person. I think he might do that. It's not a bad ask. It's a way to do it. And believe me, I have done the very same thing. But this is a big part of the reason that the leadership of this church has chosen as one of its mantras, has chosen moving forward as a big part of our vision, that deeping meaningful relationships is a huge part of the way that we see this church growing and moving forward. That if we are not in everything that we do, in every decision that we make as leadership, asking ourselves, how does this help to develop meaningful relationships, then this problem will perpetuate ourself. Because as we get to know that person on the other side of the church that we don't talk to because they're on the other side of the church, we start to develop relationships that were not there before. And then we start to recognize gifts in other people that we did not see before. Because now we have invested in them and they've invested in us and we are able to do something different. The third reason is that these things go underutilized. Our gifts go underutilized. What I mean by that is that someone offers a new idea or a fresh idea. And to us, that sounds scary because that's not the way that we've done it before. And so we decide to shelf it for now. We assume that experience equals wisdom and youth equals passion and vitality. And so we overlook the hands that are raised to do certain things But we assume that, well, they're not ready, or they're too young, or too old, or too something. And so all of these problems are clearly problems that not only do we still have in the church, but were clearly evident in the church in Corinth. There were people who had real gifts that were not being recognized, or heard, or offered. So what is to say about God, that God is one who gives these gifts What does it say about me, and how am I to respond? God gives value to what I bring to the table, whatever that happens to be. And then God values what I bring. I don't always remember that. It reminds me that for us, no one is worthless. Just like there is no place that is God forsaken. And we are to be those who prayerfully pursue each other without fear 
and without reservation. We tend to allow politeness to run the church. When what we're really preaching about and talking about and singing about is something that goes far beyond the polite, but reaches into the heart of each other and gets to understand each other's journeys in a different way. But this passage, as we're talking about gifts, is not just about my self-worth or your self-worth. If you notice, this passage doesn't really start with that. It starts in another place, like this. It says, you know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols, idols that couldn't interact with you. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. So let me break that down for you a little bit. Previously, your concept of the, of the holy included ideas and revelations unknown to you. That's when you were pagans. God was somehow hidden from you in some way, shape, or form. But now in the Holy Spirit, we are offering you quite the opposite of that. And so Paul gives an example. Anyone that knows Christ could, call, could not call him cursed. So if you hear this, you know that it does not come from the Holy Spirit. And anyone who knows Christ knows the Lord. And so, if you know that Christ is Lord, your faith is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Paul is trying to give them a sense that what they experience in God is common. And that when, they, when God is proclaimed, then the Spirit is involved. So, Paul does not begin by telling us who we are, but he starts by telling us who the Spirit is. I can never know who I am or what I should do, those two questions I'm asking, before I know something about who God is. So when we bring this back to my self-worth, it reminds me, by the way this passage begins, that my self-worth is completely wrapped up in who God created me to be. My self-worth is completely wrapped up in who Christ says that I am. And my self-worth is completely wrapped up in what the Spirit has inspired in me to accomplish. So whether it be wisdom or knowledge, faith or healing, powers or prophecy, knowing good from evil, speaking in tongues or interpreting them, all of these things, all of these things, whether they are noticeable gifts by me or not, all of them come from the same place with the same intention, that we would reflect the amazing love and compassion of God. The Holy Spirit is the pushing, prodding, whispering, shouting, dwelling and abiding pure presence of God in our midst. And so when we say that we are the church, we don't really speak of ourselves. You and I are not really the church. We are something else. We are a response. We are the music that God imagines and then writes and then plays. And so we are what is heard, but we are not the source. So I implore you, let us rally today. Let us rally each other's spirits and rally the will to seek something more. Let us see within ourselves and see with the person that's sitting next to us, that God has planted something there that perhaps we have not taken advantage of. Because there are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone is the same God at work. And thanks be to God for that. And to God be the glory this day and forevermore. Amen. And now we stand and say together, what it is that we believe this morning using a portion of a brief statement of faith. In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God. 
preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. We trust in God, who Jesus called Abba, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female, of every race and people to live as one community. And now as we go before God in prayer, I would ask if there are any joys or concerns that we would like to share one with another. For Patricia, thank you. I'm sorry? Leanne Zebley for surgery tomorrow. Thank you. I'm sorry? Carol Cantor. Cantor, okay, thank you. For Sue and Kelly. Um, I have uh, a, a couple of things. Uh, one, we could, as I said uh, in the beginning of the service, uh, just prayers for uh, Jill Gable as she uh, recovers from an uh, uh, episode of mini stroke and just for her health moving forward. Um, this also today happens to be my parents' 40th wedding anniversary. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so uh, fortunately or unfortunately, um, my mother was in town and so we had dinner last evening. Uh, uh, thank you for all the, the prayers for, uh, for my family uh, as uh, we, we had the service for my aunt who passed away this past week uh, of cancer and so uh, she was in for that service uh, and so uh, even though I was glad to see her of course there was under bad circumstances uh, but I, I appreciated all of your prayers this week uh, and certainly uh, just given the time of year uh, we would be remiss not to continue to be in prayer for our nation uh, as we remember uh, the events of 9-11 uh, we are still those who are learning what it means to love thy enemy. Uh, we are still those who are learning to what it means to be gracious. Uh, we're still being those who are learning what it means to be diligent in love and compassion uh, and to learn from each other uh, so that we might um, be the people who God calls us to be. Um, we are certainly still remembering those who have suffered great loss uh, and who continue to struggle um, in the wake of those events. And so uh, we pray as not only a church, but as one nation and as one world, as we seek to uh, live out an example of peace uh, to all of our neighbors. Any others? Well, let us pray together. God, we offer up to you, we offer up to you all that we are. We offer up to you um, all of our gifts whatever you have given us, whether we think of them as great or small, they are not small to you. And all the things that we are, we owe to you. So we ask that as we seek to be your disciples, your children, 
that we would recognize these things in, in ourselves. Because to not recognize them in our, ourselves, to not pursue them in ourselves, means that we are losing the opportunity to reflect you in those particular ways. There are people around us that, who are in need of healing and love. And even though we may not be able to heal them ourselves, we pray for your presence and we pray for the strength and the awareness to be love and compassion in their lives. Even if we can't solve those problems, we can ensure that they will not face those problems alone. God, you are one who binds us together. You are one who sees us through. And you are the one who plants in us the power to heal, to reconcile, to love, to forgive. And so as we remember times gone by, and events that have made us reimagine the world. We ask that you would continue to work on us and continue to heal our planet. And we thank you for all of the sacrifice of those who ensured that we were cared for and that people were not alone. God, we are thankful that in this day and every day, as we start this new season, that you journey with us and that you have given us ways to live and to pray. And so we do so now with the prayer you taught us saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, if the ushers will please come forward, we'll receive this morning's offer. to be con- 
God, we thank you for the willing hearts before us. And we ask that you would give us the spirit and imagination, the vision and the compassion to be your church, that we might use the gifts that you have given us to be a gift and a blessing to others. We thank you for the, for the opportunity that it is to be your church, to be loved by you and to love one another. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.
And just in case you haven't got enough of Jean Eckert, she is going to be up here for you. She's doing it all for you if you are in need of prayer or a listening ear. Thank you. My friends, I see before me a, just a wealth of gifts. Some of them that in my short amount of time I've gotten to know and gotten to know well. And others that I look forward to recognizing in the months and years ahead. And it may be that they are things that you and I discover together. Or they may be things that lie in wait for someone to ask about them. But whether they, you are begging to share them or we're discovering to them together, all of these things have one common source, which is what allows us to remember how important and precious they are. Because the same Spirit dwells within all of us, begging us and prodding us to be those individuals that we have been called to be. And we all have a responsibility to not only share those things, but to recognize them and appreciate the things that we see in each other. Because there are things that you can do that I cannot. And so we have the responsibilities as a family to be those that lift each other up in those ways. But thankfully, as we are doing the hard work of being the church and being disciples, we never do these things by ourselves. But we are loved and cherished by the one who creates us and redeems us and sustains us now and always. Amen.